All right, everybody, here with my good friend Dagan Bernstein, who is kind of a guitarist who's been into ukulele and then has moved back to guitar. Uh, but he's a very, very good ukulele player and kind of has a similar um, Howley boy and Hawaiian music background sort of thing that I have going on. So uh, I play, play with him at gigs here and there. And he has kind of his own genre that he's sort of pioneered. And I thought it would be interesting to talk start with him and find out his views on ukulele players and guitarists and Hawaiian music and all that kind of stuff. So welcome, Dagan. Thanks for hanging out. Awesome, Brad. Thanks for having me. Aloha. Yeah. So why don't you give a little background of how you got into music and especially your time playing with Uncle Brada Smitty? Yeah. Um, well, for getting into music, you know, I grew up um, in a coffee shack down in South Kona. And, you know, water catchment tank, outhouse, no TV. And both my parents who were uh, born and raised in New York City were really into music. And music was kind of our only entertainment at the house. So my dad, who's kind of a hobbyist piano player, flute player, harmonica player, we always had just instruments lying around, the record player out and about playing jazz, blues, Beatles music. And um, my mom is an artist. She always encouraged us to explore art and be creative. So I think all those things together kind of got me into music from as long as I can recall. And um, But specifically, I always point to uh, Mrs. Ikeda, third grade, Honanao Elementary School. She had a set of kamaka ukuleles, and that's how I learned my first C chord on the ukulele. And that was really the first time I kind of started playing music and playing an actual instrument um, back in third grade. So yeah, that was kind of what started it. And, uh, you know, from there, I picked up the guitar um, a couple years after that. I think I was like fifth or sixth grade. Um, my mom saw one at a garage sale for like five bucks or something, just a crappy old, you know, nylon string guitar picked that up and kind of started playing that. And um, my dad, you know, he had, he was super into the Beatles. So he had these old Beatles um, piano and guitar chord books. And so I kind of just started working my way through those, trying to um, find chords that I could do, find fingerings I could do and songs that were simple enough. And I kind of just started teaching myself um, from there. So that was kind of, kind of my beginnings. Um, with getting into music and well there's a lot of history between then and getting together with brother smitty i don't know where you want me to go um <laughs> well i i've always gotten the impression that kind of playing with brother smitty was how you really jumped into the role of being the hawaiian style ukulele player uh definitely yeah um yeah because you know that was when i was probably, I don't know, my kind of maybe my late 20s, mid to late 20s. Um, I had, I really started to get into Hawaiian music when I moved away from um, Hawaii, when Thanks. I went to college. Yeah, it's kind of a classic story. Like you leave Hawaii, you miss home, you reminisce for home. And, you know, music is that connection. Because um, I, I definitely took Hawaiian music for granted growing up here. It's just it's always around you. It's on the radio. It's at, you know, backyard parties. It's at Kani Kapila's. It's just something you hear. Um, and when I was away in college in Oregon, I really started to kind of dig deeper into just your, your classic artists, your Gabi Pahinui's, your Eddie Kamai's, um, Sunday Manoa, like all those artists. And that's when I started like learning how to play just along with these CDs, um, kind of starting to dig into the, the structure of the songs, the structure of the music, start to really try and pick apart like what musically was going on and um, how these, what made this music um, uniquely Hawaiian, what were its components. Um, you know, I did get a minor in music in college and uh, University of Oregon has a 
ethnomusicology program. So I started to study Native American music, West African music, Indian music. So I, I started to build this kind of global perspective of music and where Hawaiian music specifically fit into kind of world music and even like post-colonial music, which is really what this form of music that we call Hawaiian is. Mm -hmm. It's a, a you know, post-colonial music. Um, so all those elements, when I moved back here to Hawaii after college, I was like ready to really, um, like I wanted, really wanted to play Hawaiian music. I wanted to meet other people who were, you know, into Hawaiian music and because uh, before that I was just playing, you know, in my bedroom along with my CD player. Um, I had one friend from high school who was always super into Hawaiian music and he also had moved back here from college. So we kind of just started getting together, uh, messing around with stuff, kind of playing through the, the Gabby Pahinui catalog, um, kind of all your standard stuff. And um, he had told me about this guy um, named Brada Smitty, who is um, who was related to Gabby, who was playing around Waimea Town, and I was like, "Really?" He's like, "Yeah, you should check him out. Like, he's he's the real deal." I was like, "Okay." So one night I uh, went over to what was called Tante's at the time. I think now it must have been sitting empty now for a number of years, and uh, I walked in, and it was like time stopped when I walked into that bar. Um, Cause it, it almost was something out of like 1972, like people in Mu'umu's Palaka shirts, like the clank of the beer bottles, the whiskey, the scent of whiskey and cigarettes in the air. And, and this guy playing, I mean, I don't know what song he was playing, but it was, it was like what I imagined it would have been like to see Gabby back in the day. Um, just this 12 string guitar, the, 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 all the elements were there. The, the way the bass was being played, the way the ukulele was being played, the delivery of the vocals. It was, it was like I was hearing those recordings come to life. And I was like, wow. And I, I was hooked. I was like, I, I want to I connect with this. I want to somehow connect with this. Um, and so he was, I heard that he was hosting like an open Sunday afternoon Kani Kapila at um, Tante's restaurant where you could just kind of come, bring your ukulele and hang out and listen and uh, jam along. And so that's what I kind of started doing, just brought an ukulele. And, you know, I was literally like just sitting like to the side. I wasn't like on stage or anything. It was, there's probably 15 people jamming along with guitars, ukuleles, steel string, guitar, uh, lap steel all kinds of stuff. And I was just kind of playing along and that was where it kind of started with me um, kind of getting connected with, with Smitty and his music scene. Nice. And then from there, you got into playing more regularly with him. I know you've told, told me stories about that. How would you contrast like the real the really old school Hawaiian style of learning music, which you were kind of thrown into and that, that I kind of know, as opposed to learning in a more traditional sense, like at the Aloha Music Camp or Uncle George's workshop, where it's a little more contained. Yeah. Um, so, right, like when I when I first started sitting in, I mean, it was a Kani Kapila in that, like I said, there was, you know, 12 people, 10 people at any time playing along, you know, aunties, uncles, just all kinds of different people. And I just consistently came every Sunday. It was like what I did Sunday at two in the afternoon, I would go sit in and I kind of like started way on the left <laughs> and I just kind of slowly, I don't know, started moving in and in. Um, and then it was, you know, I don't know after how long, I mean, maybe a few months. Um, he, I kind of got there maybe a little bit earlier than, when we started and it was just maybe kind of a slower afternoon. I don't know. And he saw me come in and he's like, Hey boy, I like you sit right here. And he, and he pointed to the seat, like right next to him. He's like, you sit right here. I was like, okay. And he's like, what uncle plays. I like you play. 
And that was, that was all my instructions. What I play, you play. <laughs> and I mean, that was definitely, I felt a shift from like me just being another person there to like him kind of, you know, opening up himself to his world. Um, so after, you know, after the, the jam was done, like I would get to hang out and, you know, talk story and he was getting to know me a little bit more. And, um, from there it was kind of like each Sunday he would, he, he wanted me to sit next to him. Um, and he would kind of like either call out some chord changes or, um, mention subtle. And I say this really loosely, like mention as in like not verbally but like look at me when something would happen that i needed to be aware of or the tags at the end of the songs like like you're saying this wasn't prescribed he wouldn't say okay when i start the song i'm gonna do this it was kind of like i mean sometimes you'd physically like elbow me like watch what i'm doing because there's so many subtleties to the artistry of this music when people are at that level. Um, you know, you think of Hawaiian music as being, oh, it's just G and D7, A7, or these vamps. And it's like, when you start to pull it apart, there's, it's, it, there's a real musical complexity going on there. And I just feel I had the advantage of like I had studied enough music to understand kind of the technical part of what was going on. But I also going back to my early years learning from like listening to Beatles records or just out of the like Beatles books, like I had that musical intuition to kind of know how to instinctively um, kind of follow along with what was going on musically. Um, but I was also flailing all over the place. I mean, I mean, I was, and I say that in the most humble way, like I was really green. This was, I went from just kind of sitting in on jams to like legit playing on stages with a very revered and respected artist um, with, you know, 30 years, decades of like musical experience. And um, it, it was, easily the most challenging musical endeavor I've ever put myself through. Um, not only just being able to execute the, um, the technique behind what he was looking for, but just kind of the emotional challenge to like fulfill what um, he was looking for, like with his music and, his artistry, um, if that if that makes sense. Um, so, like I said, I mean, it was really just trial by fire. Um, there wasn't a lot of like direct instruction, and you kind of had to self assess. You had to know when you screw up, and you kind of had to know what you needed to do to fix it because there was no rule book. And I don't know. I just kind of went for it, and you know, it was the best learning experience I, I could ever ask for. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that sounds so typical of like Hawaiian style learning. That's how you do it. You, you come, you come every week, you sit on the side and you kind of wait, wait until everybody else files out of your way because, you know, it's sort of the most dedicated person gets to sit at uncle's feet. And then when that time comes, hang on for the ride because he's not going to tell you much, <laughs> but you yeah. know, if you can figure it out as you go, you know, you're going to get, get invited back. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of also that, like that growth mindset of like, you're never, and I don't want to say, I don't want to use the word good enough. Cause this isn't about like, if you're good or not good, it's just, you're always going to get pushed. There's always more you can add. Mm -hmm. um, so when people would come sit in, who were kind of like, I'm going to say like no name players and that they probably worked like they're a construction foreman or whatever. And they pull out, they'd sit down 
and they would pull out some like crazy custom kamaka where you're like, well, whoa, like <laughs> what's that thing? And they would just bust out the most like Peter Moon leads you've ever seen. And you're just like, okay, back to the drawing board. Cause it's, there's always like more, um, you can push yourself. And that was, that was the challenge. Like, you know, every time I thought like, all right, like, I got it. Like, I'm feeling good. I would just see someone else come sit in on a jam and just be like, okay, like (laughs) there's just another level here. So, yeah. There's always, always more. Yep. Well, you, you've kind of over the years, um, at least from when I've known you, you started out as a mainly ukulele player. And then um, after Brother Smitty passed, you kind of transitioned back to guitar and have been sort of pioneering your own Paniolo folk style. So would you mind talking a little bit about that and maybe play, play a song? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, when, when Smitty passed, I, I was definitely kind of at a crossroads with what I was looking to do. Um, Cause that really dominated I mean, really like five years of my life, that was like what I was musically dedicating myself to doing. Um, And I I, I still played ukulele and I was kind of trying to see where I fit in like as an ukulele player. And I was, you know, playing with maybe some different like bands that did reggae or just kind of typical singer songwriters trying to, like see if I wanted to be a side person, like a ukulele instrumentalist, but I I kind of didn't, um, that wasn't the musical identity that was inside of me. It was really um, being a songwriter, um, being a a singer was really, I kind of saw was my true passion and my true calling. So um, I just kind of sat down and started um, writing my own stuff and I definitely, um, like Johnny Cash has always been a huge influence on me. Um, my, one of the first songs I learned on guitar, like from a, I mean, I use the term guitar teacher loosely, like just at school, like there was a guitar elective, like an after school elective. And there was a guy from the Midwest who moved out here, who was doing like guitar classes and he showed me some Johnny Cash songs. So uh, from there, I'd always like loved Johnny Cash and kind of that style of like outlaw country music. And, you know, definitely being in Waimea, you know, you could hear, you know, you'd hear Hank Williams and Willie Nelson, just like you'd hear, you know, uh, Hui Ohana. It's just culturally, we have a, a, a you know, a cowboy culture over here. So when I started kind of re emerging into, Um, guitar playing and songwriting I just there was kind of this like country folk sensibility that was inside of me um, waiting to come out and um, that's kind of what I I just kind of ran with that um, kind of ran with that uh, creative mojo if you will and I just, it it seemed to just really fit naturally in between um, Hawaiian music and kind of the the acoustic folk sensibilities of Hawaiian music and really particularly um, Eddie Kamai and the Sons of Hawaii. Uh, I think if you really look at their first records, sonically, um, it's a form of American string band music with a stand-up bass the steel string guitar, the lap steel guitar, the ukulele. Um, and it's just what came out um, from me, I think, as creatives and as artists, we're kind of, um, we're a function of our environment and it's what was around me, you know, cowboys and horses and green pastures and that's kind of, and just country life. So it just, it really just felt, it felt natural um, for what I wanted to do in this next phase. And I started writing these these songs that were really kind of fit in the country folk genre. And 
that was an album I did called um, Paniolo Music was the name of the album um, because it kind of, as I was looking for a way to describe what this sound was, I had realized that there really wasn't a genre of Paniolo music per se. It wasn't like a defined genre. It was always kind of like, oh, there's Hawaiian music and there's people like Liebert Lindsay or Sonny Chillingsworth or Ernie Cruz Sr. who play with kind of a Paniolo style. But to me, those were like, it was like a distinct, distinct genre of music um, to me. So I kind of like, wanted to, um, I wanted to really bring to light this, um, this thread within the broader Hawaiian music um, category, if you will, to also allow all the different um, genres of Hawaiian music to kind of stake their ground. Because I don't look at Hawaiian music as being like this amalogous thing. Like there's mm -hmm. so many different from Kaylee E. Reichel to Liebert Lindsay, like I mentioned, to everyone in between. Like there's so many different types of music that is in Hawaiian music. And I want everyone to like really celebrate um, what they do for what it is, but also stay grounded in like Hawaiian music in the sense of we are from Hawaii. And like I said, we're um, a function of our environment. So um yeah that was kind of artistically where this kind of quote paniola music genre um that i developed came from so nice well do you have an instrument handy would you be willing to play a song uh yeah i do it's, it's kind of one of those things that you hear paniola folk music and you wonder oh what is that right 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 Actually, I just restrung this guitar, so I hope it's a. Uh... Okay. Just gonna see if is the the mic okay positioning in terms of getting some vocals and guitar. Yeah, that should should work. You just push it away a little bit more. Okay. Maybe you can angle it down a little bit. Okay. We'll just give it a go. I'll do the first track from the um, my most recent album called um, Song, Song for Waimea, and it's called Ha'aheo Nakanaka Paniolo. Nice. And yeah, to me, I feel like I really nailed it in terms of it has this minor major modulation. It's about cowboy life. It has kind of a, a nostalgic country western feel, but also... Hawaiian in a sense, so um, I'll play this one. Riding along the ancient pathways, he makes his way to wherever he needs. Horses, the Paniolo Baka, the ground to the Paniolo Sea. He climbs through the forest of Mana, guided by the hills and the wind. Like navigators that came before him, going to places they have never been. Ahio Nakanaka Paniolo, Itamaka Polonua. Sailing on the pastures as an ocean, the moon lights his way so he can see. He travels from the mountain to the shoreline, living a life so open and free. At the beach, he rests for the evening, catches fish, and sleeps under the stars with some drinks and plenty of eating and the strumming of the slacky guitar. 
So a lot of a lot of times people ask, like, what is Hawaiian style ukulele? Or, mm. you know, there's some someone asks, what are the most Hawaiian sounding ukuleles? Or what are the most Hawaiian sounding ukulele strings? Mm. And I mean, I kind of know in my heart <laughs> what that is. But especially as, you know, someone who lives in kind of in both worlds. And nowadays, as a performing guitarist who sometimes likes to have an ukulele with him on stage, what is Hawaiian style ukulele to you? Mm. Yeah, it's kind of one of those like, um, I'll tell you when I when I hear it (laughs) (laughs) kind of things. Um, I mean, yeah, there's two ways to approach it. Like, you know, there's the technical part of it, like you could sit down and piece apart the tech the specific technical components of quote hawaiian style ukulele playing um or you can also like live in that space where it's kind of this undefinable thing i don't know it's like again like i think the best way to understand it is more, I always try and look at it in the broader context. Like if you're coming from a Western perspective of there's like Western pop music and then other stuff that forces you in this dichotomy where everything has to be defined relative to like our conceptions of Western music. But I think the best way it is a global perspective i think to really understand you know not just hawaiian style ukulele playing but like slack key guitar or steel string guitar or anything what's really happening i would recommend people to really educate themselves on music cultural music cultural folk music um, music that is tied to a unique cultural subset and then once you've done that i think you can start to see it for what it is um because it's it it is it's truly it's not something you can define or else i think it's a losing game to say like well it's um it has to be played on a four string tenor ukulele made from koa wood with a high G or a low G or it's this finger picking style or you have to use it because it's again I think that's a losing game um 
just like, because even when I talk about like music tied to a specific culture, like I think that allows you to see a lot of these Western musics for what they are, um, whether it's um, um, Mississippi blues or um, Appalachian um, folk music or uh, like certain genres of country music. Um, and then it allows you to, I just think, I think you got to take music for what it is from the people who make it. I mean, that's kind of my like non-answer answer, but like, I, I really believe that. And I really, music is so vast and diverse, yet it's so similar in many ways that like, you know, I'll just take like, like I really love um, West African Kora playing, K-O-R-A, like Tumane Diabate. Like, how could you define and say like, well, what's Senegalese Kora playing? Like, you know, again, it's like, it's these really undefinable things. So, but I think if you can understand what those specific cultural musical forms are for what they are, within their own merit, it just frees you to go, hey, um, I'm just gonna like enjoy and respect it for what it is. And again, I don't know, that's the, only, that's the best I've been able to do because, you know, maybe someone else out there can really define it and write a scholarly paper on it. But I, I don't, I don't wanna, personally, I don't wanna go down that road myself <laughs> yeah it's kind of a slippery slope but it's it's interesting to think about because people ask all the time and people want to learn hawaiian style ukulele and so i end up teaching it a lot but you can teach people all the notes and they play it back to you and it doesn't sound any bit of hawaiian so you know how do you how do you approach that and try and help them understand how best they can you know portray portray the style yeah, I mean, I use bluegrass as a parallel. Um, bluegrass wasn't a form of music I really grew up around or, I mean, I didn't know Bill Monroe um, growing up, but when I when I went to college in Oregon in kind of the late 90s, early 2000s, there was kind of this re resurgence of bluegrass style and I, I really dug it. And I didn't know how to play bluegrass music. So what I did is I just found some jams and sat in and, excuse me, and listened and observed and kind of tried to pick apart what the musical sensibilities of that genre of music was. And that's how I learned it. Um, again, like these musical forms that are really tied to a specific culture I think that's the only way. That's the only way to learn it. Um, you know, I mean, having some basic understanding of like some simple techniques, of course, is smart. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, like kind of knowing, okay, these are some chord forms to watch out for. These are some kind of typical chord voicing voicings that are used or some progressions or turnarounds. Um, but from there, I, I think you really got to, you got to get in there with the people making it. And like I did, like kind of sit in the side, uh, observe, kind of watch it unfold, find your way in and get a mentor, get someone who it, it plays that kind of music and who's willing to take the time to maybe sit with you. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of Hawaiians have moved out of Hawaii and, you know, are around the mainland. So like anyone in the mainland, like find, find like a little Hawaiian club or a, a ukulele kani kapila maybe that's going on in your area and try and find someone who is from Hawaii and grew up playing this kind of music. And, you know, I think they would love to, love to share what, what they know. Um, and uh, kind of, just observe and try and just I mean, the best way is to just sit in with some people and just play and you'll start to get, you'll start to get a feel for it. Um, Cause it's gotta come, it's gotta come from inside. It has to be something you feel. Um, Cause I, I mean, I've, I've been 
trapped in that trying to overthink it. And every time I've done that, I've, <laughs> I end up kind of stunting my ability to connect on a, on a more uh, soulful level with the music. Right. Yeah. Nice. It's all, all interesting stuff to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that you're a big proponent of that I've always admired in this rough little thing we call the music business on Hawaii Island and especially Waimea Hamakua area is that you don't play at businesses for free. Mm. We, can cut, we can cut this part out if you're not comfortable talking about it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you always, that's, that's kind of like your rule is that you're providing, you're more like you consider yourself kind of a contractor. And if you're playing out of business, you know, you hold yourself to that standard and the business to that standard. I mean, of course you do charity stuff as well, but that's separate. Do you mind elaborating on that? Cause every time we talk about this, I'm always fascinated by your take. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, you kind of said it. I mean, to me, it's, it's pretty simple. Like, um, you know, I'm a musician. I have a service I can provide. If you're a business, you pay for that service. And, you know, I, that's just what I do. That's just something I, I hold on to and I value. Um, and it's, it's hard because we're not, um, there's not like a huge burgeoning music scene here in the sense that you might get in a big city. Um, where it's a small town, these are small country towns, they're small country businesses. Um, but I think every place I've played, they try and um, take care the best they can with whatever monetary compensation they can afford. And if, for me as a artist or a creative, I have to decide if that aligns with um, what I, um, what I believe in, or if it feels okay for me, for, uh, what I'm providing, if that compensation is, is, uh, meritable. Um, so, you know, I also, you know, for me, like this is additional income. Like I have a, a full-time job, like I'm an educator. I am a, I've, I earn a salary, um, but I also feel that I owe something to all musicians to hold the businesses I interact with to that standard. Yeah. And that's the hardest part because I have to think outside of myself. This isn't just about me. Um, like wanting the gig for the gig's sake. Like there's, there is um, a, a network of my fellow musicians that I feel I owe it to, to make sure that I present my services at a certain level of professional expectation to hopefully give businesses um, an insight into what they need to do um, in order for this relationship to continue reciprocally. And I think that's the hardest part. Like, I, you know, I, I get it. There's, there tends to be a kind of reputation around music as being secondary and you can always find someone who will do it for free. And to me, that's, that's, kind of a big issue or that's the big part of what makes it hard is you, you can find musicians who will play for free so why why pay someone and right and that to me is where um i've realized like i need to hold my own and be like all right this is what i do and this is what i expect and because i want the next musician that comes through to also get compensated um, monetarily for what they do. 
Um, cause it's, it's a service and it, it's, it's as simple as that. I, I don't try and like slice it up too many ways or overthink it. Like it's a service that I can provide your business to support your business and to make your business function, you know, better as an entertainment venue or a restaurant venue. And, you know, you can just like you're going to pay for your um, food you cook up in the kitchen. Like you can pay for the music to cook up in your, in the front of the house and it makes everyone happy. And I think the businesses that do operate that way, get it. And yeah. I've just noticed that they tend to, uh, <laughs> they tend to stick around a lot longer. Right. That's it's as simple as that. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not here to like tell people how to run their business. That's their Kuleana, but I, I can, I can dictate how I run my business and I, you know, I just tend to say thanks, no thanks um, to those situations when they say, Hey, you know, you can put out a tip jar or it's great exposure. And it's like, okay, you know, mahalo, but um, I'm just going to pass on that. So yeah, maybe if you come, if you come cook, cook me dinner at my house. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the classic uh, rebuttal, right? Uh, but you know, it is what it is. Like I said, I just, we're kind of like small. We're, you know, we're more country and we might be small, but I, I st that still um, doesn't, to me, it's still not an excuse to try and um, not, I mean, it just comes down to integrity. That's it. It's just, you know, I hold myself to integrity and I would expect a big, a business that is of high integrity to, to do the same. So, you know, it's all good. That's just my, that's my view on it. And, I'm sticking to my story. <laughs> That's great. No, I, I like like to hear that because a lot of times it can be discouraging to try and find your way on a small small music scene like this, and it's inspiring to hear that you know, yeah, we're worth it. We we're worth it, and we provide provide that service. And it's it's easy yeah. to say, oh yeah, I'll, I'll play for free. I mean, whatever, help you guys out. But then when you put it frame it like that that you kind of have that responsibility to your fellow musicians. That's the big one, man. And like, I, it's, t it's, I, I, it's taken me years to kind of get that. Like I've played a lot of gigs and I've done a lot of stuff for a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. And it's taken me a while to really look at it that way. Um, and because yeah, we're all kind of in this pool together and we really got to try and, you know, Malama each other the best we can and help each other out to make it make it work, <laughs> make it go. All right. Well, uh, maybe one last thing that we've kind of discussed over the past couple of weeks: Taimane on Tiny Desk. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So what did what did you think? Can you uh, give a a brief overview of how you think it affects the whole outlook of the ukulele community, or the greater community looking in at the ukulele? community yeah 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 I'm, i mean i'm a i'm a hardcore diehard tiny desk watcher um so when i saw that pop up i was like whoa um you know i i thought it was great i thought it was great um i think it's a great platform for the ukulele to enter into um I think it's a great platform for a musician from Hawaii to enter into. Um, I hope it can do two things. I mean, one, I hope it can really open up more um, people to the musicians coming out of Hawaii. Um, Cause I, I think there's like some legit talent and some, I think some, some legit like musically interesting things coming out of here. And I also hope it can open people up to the full spectrum of what's possible on the ukulele. Um, Cause you know, like for me personally, I mean, I'll, I'll be straight up. Like I don't listen to her music per se. I don't like when her music comes out, like I'll give it a listen just out of artistic curiosity, but I don't play it um, and, you know, listen to it from day to day. It's not kind of my thing. Um, but I think she's doing something really unique in just her presentation as an artist, 
um, the way her stage setup is, how she plays, how she interacts with her audience and her instrument. Um, I don't think we've quite, um, I've been a little, personally, a little disappointed in kind of some of the progression of ukulele playing in this last like 20 years, like since Jake has kind of opened up the doors, like some things have been a little cookie cutter, like I was kind of hoping we would have progressed a lot quicker with more diversity of styles and playing and, you know, females and males. And, you know, I know there's a lot out there, like you can go on Instagram or YouTube and see like heavy metal ukulele and like all kinds of stuff. But I don't know. I, I, I was, I was hoping by now that we'd have like just more flavors. That's all. And to me, I think she's got an interesting flavor. Um, it's not something I, like, again, I, I totally want to order every time I go to the ice cream shop, but it's, to me, it was like, it was kind of cool to just see it um, on Tiny Desk, because, I mean, the number of musicians who have played that, you know, Tiny Desk thing, and who have gotten pretty big exposure through that, um, it was cool to see a, a musician from Hawaii. Um, to do that. And I just hope it's the first of many. Um, I hope it wasn't just kind of like a, a one-off thing, like, oh, okay, we tossed a Hawaii musician a bone and we'll, we'll move on. Because like I said, I think there's a lot of um, musicians coming out of Hawaii who are doing some interesting things. And such as, I mean, who would you, um, who would you see next? Who's, who's going to be next on Tiny Desk? Oh, God, that's a great question. Um, I know we have our kind of like little underground scene here on the big island of people. Um, God, you know, I'm super disconnected from like the Oahu scene. Um, off the top of my head, I can't say like anyone's really jumping out at me. I would just say in general, there seems to be an urge to like break out and there's an openness to kind of new genres, whether it's hip hop or Latin or um, rock or whatever, but there's kind of, we have such a solid foundation here and culturally like respect for what's come before us is so strong that like, I still think people are come with a strong, like, respect for um, the musicians that came before us. So, again, I, I haven't, like, I would, I would still say I haven't really quite seen one person where I'm like, all right, that's, that's the real, like, genre busting artist. But I just, in general, I just get this sense that we're kind of slowly priming the pump where, like, someone who really there could be some like 14 year old kid out there who's doing something in their bedroom right now with garage band who's just gonna like blow up you know because um like I, I i've heard some stuff on soundcloud from like some people i don't even know who they are i don't even know what their names are like i've heard some like kanaka rap that's like mind-blowing like full rapping in Olelo Hawaii and just stuff like that like I, I don't know what it's going to be and like I said I don't have any names but I feel like something's bubbling down there um and um that they might be kind of the the forebearers of of kind of someone someone getting out there it ain't going to be the person who's been winning the Hawaiian Grammys. That's all I'm saying. I'm not naming any names. You can go Google it. <laughs> but it ain't going to be it ain't going to be our Hawaiian Grammy winner. I'll tell you that. That'll be my controversial statement of the podcast. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Mark my words. Yeah, next week that'll be the next tiny desk. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh god. Then I got to come back on this podcast. But for now I'll take Taimane, you know, all things considered. Hey, it could have been worse. I, I think she, she, she brought it. She rocked it. It was cool. And, uh, you know, again, I hope, I hope we can see some more. I hope, I hope whoever's running their tiny desk can kind of go, oh, let's see what's going on in Hawaii. Like, what is going on? And come check us out because 
there's some real talent out here, you know. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing your time with us. Would you mind playing one more song to kind of play, play us out? Do you happen to have an ukulele in your mind that you could oh. rip a tune on? I know, I know that you're kind of a little, little rough, but I played with you at the <laughs> ukulele festival. I know, you, I know you got it. Yeah, yeah, I can still. No, I can still strum. It's just sitting in on a full jam where I, if I was doing leads, I would probably fumble around a little bit more than a. Uh, um, yeah, let's do. Um, I'm gonna do this song for Waimea. Uh, it's the title track from the album um because you know it sounds nice on ukulele and uh yeah i'll leave 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 you uh with this one let's give this one a go here all right this is a song for white male i walk the long streams is the wind and the rain Awesome. I miss, I miss playing those songs live with you. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, hopefully we can uh, get back 
get back into it. We take this thing right and uh, yeah, play in front of people again. It's getting boring playing in my bedroom. <laughs> for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah, stay home, everybody. Stay home. Seriously. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Dagan. Um, how best can people find you if they're interested in your music, learning more? Um, uh, website, daganmusic.com, D-A-G-A-N music.com. And of course, on the socials, Insta and Facebook, Dagan Music. Um, been definitely a little less on the socials this past year, trying to give myself a brain break. But um, I think the website's really built up where you can kind of engage with it. There's some great resources. It's built around the Song for Waimea album. So you can see some videos, read some stuff, listen to some songs about Waimea and really kind of dive in a little bit more to the whole vibe of the album. So check that out. Sweet. Well, thanks so much for coming on and for hanging out with me for this past hour. Awesome. Thank you, Brad, for doing this. Super yeah. awesome. And uh, hopefully we can maybe do it again sometime. Yeah, for sure. We got nothing but time right now. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. All right. Well, take care of yourself, man. And All right. yeah, catch you down the road. Sounds good. Aloha, Brad. Aloha.